Hello again, welcome back to Incidental Information. I'm Mark, and today I'm going to do something different, uh, an idea that I've had for quite some time. It's uh, kind of cold in the basement, so I'm not going to be working on any machinery. So I thought I'd give this a try, no time like the present. Uh, as you know, I am a, I'm an amateur radio operator. I am also um, an engineer. Uh, I spent most of my engineering career uh, in electronic engineering, although that diverged into uh, a lot of other fields of engineering as well. I was a technical manager for um, academic institutions for most of most of my career so we got into a little bit of everything physics and chemistry and biology and plant maintenance you know everything um, even a little astronomy so my perception of science and uh, science and uh, mathematics which is really for the most part the language that define science or describe science is a little different I think than most people's and what the purpose of this video is is uh, it's, it's for the uh, for the lay community for the non-professional for the amateur for the hobbyist to get an understanding of transmission lines and antennas uh, electromagnetic fields, if you will, from a slightly different perspective. This is always taught, generally explained from a very mathematical point of view, which is why I, I've left this on my whiteboard. I was explaining to my son the other day some, some of the vagaries of trigonometry. Trigonometry is, is extremely important in, in, uh, in, in math and science. And uh, from trigonometry, we can move into functions and calculus, and it's it's just it's a it's a wonderful stepping stone. Uh, that and algebra, uh, to me, are the two pillars of of uh, mathematics. Um, so that being said, not everybody understands complex concepts in the real world. In terms of mathematics. For some people this works very well. They see the equations, they understand the relationship between the that, that which is divided and multiplied and commutative and associative and all and all of that makes sense to them. And then you can describe the real world to people using mathematics and they go, oh very good, I get it. But that doesn't work for most people. So here's my conundrum. As an amateur radio operator, I meet a lot of people who are, they're not engineers, they're not scientists, this is not what they do for a living. They're amateurs. They enjoy the pursuit as a hobby, not a vocation. So there is less need, I guess, I was going to say <laughs> a drive or an impetus to, to understand the nuances of this uh, electromagnetic stuff. But here's what that has led to. Now you would think amateur radio operators would understand how antennas and transmission lines work. I mean, that's, it seems pretty fundamental to the whole hobby, right? Well, that's not the case. And what this has led to is a lot of snake oil salesmen, a lot of misinformation, and that misinformation has grown into almost a, a, a culture, or at least linguistically, of m incorrect descriptions of things and incorrect assumptions on how things work. And a lot of times, the observed 
characteristics of a given system seem to fit with this mischaracterization of how things work. So everybody sees a reality that in fact doesn't exist. But if they, if they do X or they do Y, this happens, and it seems to happen fairly repeated, except for when it doesn't. And when it doesn't, they simply dismiss it as, well, there's something else that we're not aware of. There's something mysterious going on here. It's a little bit of black magic, or you can't account for everything. Or the one you hear the most is, well, it didn't work because that ballon or this antenna is a piece of crap, or that coax is bad, or that coax is the wrong length, or the, the connector must be shorted, so I'll chop 10 feet off the cable and re-splice and put a new connector on it. Oh, gee, now it works. Or at least I get a different reading. And they just dismiss the vagaries as, you know, inconsequential anomalies. When, in fact, there's nothing vague about it. It can all be analyzed. But, as I said, the mathematics is not necessarily the tool that everyone possesses to do the analysis. So here's what I'm going to try to do. And I'm not quite sure exactly how this is all going to fall out. I may just erase all of this video and, and say, no, nah, we can't do this. What I'm going to do is I want to describe in practical terms the function of antennas, transmission lines, impedance, uh, standing wave ratios, power transfer, um, antennas, uh, electromagnetic fields, etc. In terms of not so much pure mathematics or numbers that ultimately describe magnitudes, but rather to describe it in terms of phase. That may not sound any less complicated to you. Maybe the numbers are, will be clearer. But in fact, one of the ways in which electromagnetic or, or tra antennas and transmission lines uh, come together in my mind, or what I should say, what made it click at some point in my career, was a almost tangible concept of how the waves travel on a line. And it happened early on in my career in a microwave lab of all places where we use in teaching what's known as a slotted line. And it's, it's a line of variable length and there is a probe that you can slide along the line. So you can take readings at different points in the line. And all other things remaining static, you get all these different readings. And all of a sudden, click, a light goes on. And you begin to think of transmission lines and antennas, not so much in terms of the magnitude, because it's, the magnitude is all relative, but in terms of how the signal flows, how the waves move. So let's think of that in terms of a guitar string. You have a, a wave on a guitar string. In fact, let's draw that. Okay, so this is not going to be totally devoid of mathematics. We are going to use some numbers. They, we have to describe some numbers in terms of magnitude. And I'm going to use some classical mathematical concepts. Um, and the first mathematical concept that I'm going to describe, which is really important, and it's often overlooked, is the concept of zero. Zero. Nothing. Nada. Zip. It's important. Zero in terms of time, phase, or magnitude. 
but we got to start somewhere. So let's take our string. And in this case, it's terminated at both ends. It's a guitar string, which means the magnitude at each end has to be zero. So we're going to start with a point. Let me change color. Zero at the beginning and zero at the end. It's a half a wave. It cannot be anything other than a half wave. If it's going to be resonant, if we're going to be able to hear that string, if this fluctuation is going to be able to go up and down for any period of time, it must be a half wave. And we can determine that to be the fundamental note. Can we have a frequency lower than that? Lower than that? Probably not. So it has to be at least a half a wave. The next harmonic, if you will, still maintaining zero at both ends where it is anchored, would be a full wave. Because this condition of zero at each end must be complied with. So we have F1. We have F2. F3. And so on. And this is what makes the timber, the tone, the complexity of the sound of a guitar string. Um, some of it is going to be interaction from the wood in the guitar, in the body. Uh, some of it is going to be um, differences in the density of the string, if it's a, a wound string. Um, it's steel inside, it's brass on the outside, it's different weight, different elasticity. Some of it is going to be the influence of longitudinal waves. Waves not just traveling perpendicular to the, to the string, but waves traveling up and down the string. You know, differences in tension traveling up and down the string. So that's all going to add to the complexity of this. So I've drawn F1, F2, F3, and in reality there, there may be hundreds of different waveforms. But they're all going to comply with the termination to some degree. There will be energy lost at these endpoints. There will be energy transferred to the guitar and from the guitar to its body and from its body to the air and from the air to our ears and so on. So there will be some energy absorbed here. So we have essentially like in an, in an antenna system, we have some types of load and that energy will be transferred most efficiently when the loads react compliantly with, with the energy in the string. And ultimately the string will not resonate forever because there's going to be some damping. There's going to be losses. We're going to, that energy is going to be absorbed. It's going to be lost. The energy is going, you know, the, the string is going to resonate for some period of time. Musicians call that sustain and it will eventually fade away. So there you go. It's a wave and we're talking about phase. So <clears throat> let's change this up a little bit. You go back to the math for a second. 
and talk about just the wave itself. For those of you who really didn't like math class, You may look at this and go, oh, no, please. Okay. <laughs> but we've got to talk about it. It's important. A sine wave. A pure, perfect sine wave is it is the function of a rotating body in mechanical terms. If I take a point, I'm going to start at nine o'clock over here. If I take a point and I, and I, and this is on my, on my Y coordinate. Okay. Y is up and down. Right. As I rotate that body, my, my Y is going to change. When I rotate 90 degrees, my Y will now be up here. And 90 degrees corresponds to one quarter wave. I know this is simple for most of you, but if I come around to three o'clock, I am now on my y on my y axis i am back at 0 at 180 degrees so 180 straight across the circle at 6 o'clock we are at 270 And I'm calling this zero over here, obviously. And finally, when I come back to nine o'clock, I am back to zero at 360 degrees, which is the same as zero for our purposes in terms of a single wave. And for this discussion, for in For most of this discussion, we're not going to deal with anything greater than a single wave because they are repetitive. We can take the single wave and we can add 1, 2, 3, 5, 50 and basically start from 0 to 360 each and every time. The characteristics at any individual point along that line are going to be the same for a given direction and amplitude and phase. So, we'll simplify matters a little bit. This, this is um, a sine, a sine wave, or as, as some of you may prefer, sine. Um, the values that we assign to these phase angles, the sine of the angle would be, if this is obviously zero, this is plus one, zero, minus one, and zero. And if we look at this in terms of the x-axis, we have a position along x. So when we go from y0 to here, y, y, y is 0. When we go to y equals 1, our x, our position on the x-axis is 0. When y equals 1, the position on the x-axis is 0. Huh. 
That doesn't seem obvious from this graph, does it? But in fact, it is. So, x equals 0 at 90. It also equals 0 at 270. So, as we continue around the circle, we can take a corresponding wave, and that is the cosine. And the cosine is simply shifted 90 degrees. And that's how we end up with sine x or sine theta I should say sine of the angle equals cosine ninety minus theta so it's just shifted ninety degrees And we're not going to be dealing with the cosine, but I just, I just mention it because it's, it's occasionally useful. Okay, so let's, let's get away from that for the moment. And I want to give you a slightly different representation. Of the guitar string. In fact, it's not going to be a guitar string. It's going to be, we could use an antenna or we could use a transmission line. We'll use a transmission line. We'll call it a transmission line. And we're going to pick a length in terms of phase. We're not dealing with frequency. We're not dealing with feet and inches, meters. We're not going to play around with velocity yet. We'll get to all of that. We're just going to pick a line in terms of phase. And our phase is going to be one complete wave, a full cycle, 360 degrees. And again, do this in red. Okay, so there's our transmission line. Now the difference here is being a transmission line, we have a radio. And the radio is generating a signal, which is a sine wave. And internal to that radio is an impedance. That impedance is 50 ohms. Doesn't have to be 50 ohms. Could be something else, and we'll talk about that later as well. But for now, it's going to be 50 ohms. We understand what that is. Everybody knows. Get a UHF connector in the back of your radio. It's 50 ohm output. So we assume. So it's 50 ohms. And, uh, I'm just going to show this as being grounded. We'll assume for the sake of this argument that it's, it's a perfect ground. There's no losses. It completely connects any ground currents to the load at the other end. Here's our load. Another 50 ohms. Everybody's happy, right? This 50 ohm output impedance is internal to the source. It's a characteristic impedance. What is meant by a characteristic impedance? Well, let me back up a little. If I have a battery 
I'm going to draw this as an actual circuit. If I have a battery and that battery has a, a characteristic uh, impedance of 10 ohms and say it's 10 volts. Okay, so that's, that's, my, that's my, my battery. Okay. And out here, I have a 10 ohm load. It's a series circuit. The voltage is in the loop. The voltage is in a circuit, and this is in the chapter one, I think. Or maybe it's chapter three now. Fundamentals in uh, the Amateur Radio Handbook. The voltages in a series loop all have to add up to equal the source. Well, the source is 10 volts. We have 10 ohms and 10 ohms. So we're going to have five volts across this resistor and we're going to lose 5 volts across the internal impedance the internal resistance of the battery so uh, obviously a good battery is going to have a lot lower internal resistance than this one but nevertheless what we have here is a condition of maximum power transfer. Very important concept for what we're going to talk about. Whenever we talk about standing waves or signals coming back or losses on a line, or we're always talking about getting the most we can into the air maximum power transfer and if we vary this say we vary our load I can find a condition from from zero to oh maybe I'll take this up to about 50 ohms okay so it's a 50 ohm potentiometer we're going to vary it from 0 to 50 and if I graph if I graph my current on here at 0 ohms I'm going to have a maximum current flowing at 50 ohms I'm going to have a minimum current flowing it's going to look like that if I graph my voltage, so this is current. This is going to, well, we'll get to that in a moment. Um, if I graph my voltage at zero, I'm going to have minimum voltage. And at 50, I'm going to have a maximum voltage. Let me do that in a different color. Okay, so there's my, there's my voltage. Remember the concept of zero. Very important. Zero volts. How much power am I dissipating? I got a lot of current flowing. How much power am I dissipating? Nothing. There's no power being dissipated. It's a short. At zero current, or well, very low current, and a maximum voltage, how much power am I dissipating? Not a hell of a lot. Don't have a lot of don't have a lot of current there. Got a lot of voltage, but it's not a lot of current flowing. Where am I going to dissipate the bulk of my power? Right here. At 10 ohms. And that's just the way it is. Power is going to be maximum when the load and the source are matched. And it's a simple matter of I squared R, V squared over R, I times V. It's just 
you have the optimum condition. You have the highest voltage for the highest current possible. On either side of that point, your current's going to drop or your voltage is going to drop and you're not going to have the most power dissipated. So where's, where's the remaining power going to be dissipated? Here. Now power is not constant in this circuit. Obviously the battery is going to be delivering a, a, a much greater load at zero than it, it does when this is at 50. It's going, it's because the battery, as far as the battery is concerned, is going from 10 to 60. Okay, so the curve is not, you know, necessarily a nice, neat curve because it has a it has a slope to it as well. But you get the idea. Maximum power transfer, the load, and the source must be the same. They must be equal. Okay, very important, very very important concept. It doesn't change. It doesn't change for RF, it doesn't change for the energy in a string, uh, it doesn't change for the, the air resonating in a speaker chamber, I mean it's just maximum power transfer, it's all the same. Um, I, I, I've always told my students um, my apprentices, what have you, is I kind of look at science as it's, it's all the same stuff. The equations are all the same, whether you're dealing with optics or sound or electrons. It's, you tend to see the same equations all the time. It's just each discipline uses a different set of Greek letters for their, for their values. Even in, it's in mathematics, we use J to represent um, the imaginary part of a complex impedance and mathematicians um, use I for the square root of negative one. Um, I squared, which is where my, the name of my channel, Incidental Information, comes from. It's, you know, it's I squared, it's square root of negative one. Um, but we haven't gotten around to getting a logo up on the channel yet. <laughs> we'll get there. Okay, back to this. So here we have a condition where the source matches the load and everybody's happy, right? Well, it turns out that the transmission line also needs to have an impedance that matches both the line and the load. Why is that? You'd think it does, it's, it's not transparent, it doesn't really matter. Turns out it does. Let's, let's go back and look at the transmission line all by itself. And I'm going to draw, well, I'll do, I'll do a ladder line because I know a lot of guys like ladder line. So we'll show a ladder line. Okay, there's a ladder line. Gee. That's not a ladder line, that's a Pi network. Well, yeah, it's a Pi network. So between the two wires, okay, it's infinitely long by the way. <laughs> between the two wires, there's going to be some capacitance. Okay, it's a given. You have a difference in voltage between two conductors, you have a dielectric between them. In this case, air, a little moisture, some nitrogen. And if you have a current flowing 
obviously. If we have a current flowing, then there's going to be some magnetic field generated around the wire. The magnetic field is an inductance. But here's the thing. If we take our inductance and we take our capacitance and we multiply them together and take the square root and do a few calculations, like I say, I'm going to stay away from the math here. But what you end up with is you end up with a characteristic impedance. You end up with a net impedance. This network appears as a certain impedance. It's characteristic impedance and it's if the physical components of the line are the same, the physical characteristics remain the same, then the impedance is going to be the same all the way down the line. And that's how the RF signal entering the line sees it, sees it as a characteristic impedance load. But the interesting thing here, and this gets into the calculus of it, is that this is not just an inductance and some capacitance. It is an infinite number of very small inductances all the way along on both sides of the line. And I don't have a Sharpie with a fine enough point, obviously, but there's an infinite number of capacitors. And the inductance, you can reduce the, the value of the inductance smaller and smaller and smaller. And as you do, you will, you will reduce the value of the capacitance smaller and smaller and smaller. It'll never approach zero. Well, it'll approach zero, but it'll never be zero. It'll always have some finite value. But the relationship between the L and the C of the line will remain fairly constant as long as the physical characteristics of the line remain the same. So this is our characteristic impedance. It's a series, it's a network. Now there's also some resistance in here. It's copper after all, or copper, in the case of an antenna, it's copper clad steel, and some transmission lines are also copper clad steel. But suffice to say, it's not a superconductor it's going to have some value of resistance. It may be very small, but it's going to be there, and that's going to contribute loss. Okay, so there's our line. The impedance of this line happens to be, we'll give you a little math here, equals um, 276 um, times the log of well this is this is s the spacing here and this is the diameter of the line can we see this on the screen let me see look at my camera i may be writing that a little bit small okay so d Um, <clears throat> now, obviously, you probably know this already, because you're ham radio operators. As S increases, so does the impedance of the line. It goes up, right? The, you know, 300, 300 ohm line is about yay big, and 450 ohm line is about yay big, and 600 ohm line is, a, is about wider still. So, S is going to be in the numerator and D is going to be in the numerator, denominator. So you can figure this out. You can derive these equations if you need to. But that's generally the impedance for, um, for open wire transmission line. Um, there's some other weird things going on here. You have some 
some variables that have to do with the the uh, the mu of the dielectric and and leakage and resistivity and skin effect and various things um, but it reduces down to that basically for our purposes and very quickly just so not to leave you guys out coaxial enthusiasts the um, same thing applies to the coax you can actually draw the same drawing it looks like an open wire line if you want for a, a coaxial line the only difference is um, really your source and load how they take how they take current and voltage on and off the line um, so with, a trans with an open wire line you want to be able to do that completely in differential mode where a current flowing out on one is flowing back on the other in the case of a coaxial line the same thing is occurring but we don't think of it that way because we want to think of the of the shield as being grounded as always being zero and um, unless you want to don't want it to radiate but we'll we'll get to that at some point too okay so here you have the same conditions you have an inductance in the conductors and you have a capacitance between them and the equation for this is 138 and again we have the diameter of the outer conductor and the diameter of the inner conductor and as the inner conductor becomes smaller or the outer conductor becomes larger the impedance of the line goes up so it's 138 times the log of diameter over diameter and you, you can see that it's essentially s over s over d or d over d s is a function of the outer diameter of the shield so it's, it's, the, it's the same equation uh, this is log to the base 10. It's probably the only log most of you will ever deal with. Count yourselves lucky. <laughs> Although there are some really cool things about natural logarithms, but I'm not going to get into that now. And uh, I actually think they use, well, I don't know. I, I know they still teach it in economics. I don't, I, don't know, I don't know what they're teaching engineers these days because the ones I've met or electrical engineers. Somebody told me the other day that electrical engineering is no longer a thing. It's like if you go to school, you have to pick a subject. So if you want to become an electrical engineer, you have to pick like, you know, software engineering or power engineering or this engine. It's, I don't know. I'm kind of glad I, I'm, I'm not in that realm anymore. Okay, so. Characteristic impedance, really important. 